I need for my viewers to listen to part of this. This is a message pertaining to Elijah. And the only reason why that I'm piggy tailing off of somebody else's message is because it's very inspiring, first of all. And second of all, it has a lot of characteristics that are similar towards the things that I have went through, but I'm not quite yet as good of a speaker as this particular speaker. So please allow for me to allow for him to be a part of your viewing base in regards to this particular message about Elijah. You say, there's somebody in the Bible like that? Absolutely. The Bible says of this person that he is a person of like experiences as we are. And his name is Elijah. Elijah is one of the greatest overcomers in the Bible. And as we study his life, we will learn what it means to overcome in an age like the age in which you and I are living. I want to take you on a tour of Elijah's life. Obviously, I can't tell you the whole story. It covers a lot of scriptural ground. But we're going to drop into a few key places along the way of Elijah's journey. And we're going to learn the overcoming secrets of this key Old Testament character. During the regime of Ahab and Jezebel, the northern kingdom of Israel sank into the moral sewer. And Jezebel went on a campaign to hunt down and slaughter all the true prophets of God. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, one of the most unusual heroes of scripture made a dramatic appearance. Elijah the prophet. Elijah was not a writing prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. He was a preaching prophet and a miracle working prophet. And the story of Elijah is contained in the Bible in just eight chapters from 1 Kings 17 to 2 Kings chapter 2. He made such an impact by his life. He's mentioned often in the New Testament. So I want us to learn tonight from the life of this man five lessons that can help us overcome the attempts of our culture to intimidate us. Are we up for that? Let's, let's study the Word of God together. The first thing we noticed about Elijah was he was firm in his convictions. In the 1 Kings 17, 1, as we're introduced to this man, we read these words. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Now let's put that in context. Elijah shows up, there's nobody to introduce him. There's no preparation. Now, the reason why that a lot of people speculate that one of the two witnesses are in fact going to be Elijah is because Elijah had these type of powers during the time that he was walking and talking amongst us because God had given him those powers. Just like any of the Christians, if you're a true born-again Christian, you not only have the power through God of doing good, but you also have the power through God of bringing forth stuff that a lot of people call bad. It's not a good thing for it not to rain for approximately three or four years during the time that Elijah made this prophecy. Rather than me, myself, and I working in and through the Holy Spirit declaring a complete total drought upon to the American land, I prayed, God, let your will be done. And the only thing that I have declared openly in a prophecy, well, I've declared two or three different things, but, but the main thing that I declared as far as uh, natural catastrophes is electrical disturbances. And of course, electrical disturbances can come with the wind, it can come with the rain, it can come with the snow and ice, it can come with tornadoes, it can come with hurricanes, it can come in multiple ways pertaining to electrical disturbances. I had the opportunity that I could have went ahead and set back in my prophecy towards seeing a major earthquake in the West Tennessee area 
pertaining to the New Madrid Fault that basically begins somewhere around Memphis and goes all the way up towards St. Louis. But rather than to see that type of devastation fall upon to humanity pertaining to desecrating our roads, desecrating our bridges, desecrating other things, buildings, and, and basically property, once more, I prayed to God, God, thy will will be done. So I backed off of that prophecy within about a week or two, right before Christmas, right before the year 20 and 19 began. I think it was 20 and 19. It may have been 20 and 18 began. I'm pretty sure it was 20 and 19. It may have been 20 and 18. It may have been 20 and 18. Because one of those years I was up at uh, Pebble Island, up towards New Johnsonville in Waverly County, Waverly, Tennessee. And uh, that's whenever I had made the forecast or the prophecy of that. Once more, for people to think that anybody, regardless whether it be Jesus Christ, Elijah, Moses, or any of the old prophets throughout the old Bible or the new prophets throughout the new Bible, if anybody thinks that these people are going to tremendously come out of the ground and start walking and talking amongst us, they're, they're really emphasizing a little bit more in the glory of God than what is actually reasonable. Now, does that mean that Elijah's spirit is not alive and well today, and that Elijah's spirit don't dwell with some of us, including myself? Absolutely. That that could that could go just as easily for me as it, as it would be anybody, or the spirit of Moses, or the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of the Holy Spirit, to make sure that you're in the hollow hand of God. What he's going to say here this minister that's talking, that has a support team, that has a congregation, he's going to tell you that Elijah had two different personalities. He had a personality towards being humble, faithful, graceful, likable, obtainable. But he also had a personality to where he could pray down fire and that he could bring down the wrath of God upon to society if it was deemed necessary through the eyes of not only himself, but through the eyes of God that anointed him to do this. So please listen, because this, this, the message that this minister is bringing forth pertaining to the message of Elijah strikes very close similarities to that in which what I have to go through or have been through just within the past 30 plus years since God has anointed me for me to be a messenger, for me to bring forth a message unto the people, regardless whether I'm praying up in land between the lakes or I'm praying here at 291 Thompson Road. So please listen to this message because it does have similarities, not only in my life, but I'm sure in others too as well. Because Elijah was persecuted to the to, to degrees like we could never ever imagine that may have actually exceeded that in which what I have been through with not only the, the Kentucky authorities, with not only the Oklahoma authorities, with not only the Georgia authorities, but also the Tennessee authorities. So please listen. For Elijah, one day Ahab looked up and there he stood. Notice how he described himself. The Lord God of Israel before whom I stand. Ladies and gentlemen, in an age of idolatry, Elijah knew the true God of heaven. He knew Jehovah of Israel, and he knew what it was like to stand in God's presence. That's what made him different. And this has got to be true for us if we're going to withstand the intimidation of our society. The fundamental way to overcome the intimidation of a fallen culture is to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. In all things and in all times to glorify Him. Have one goal in your life, not many, just one, to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let come what may, Absolutely. when we know Him and stand in His presence. Absolutely. And we can say with Elijah, before whom I stand. And we know that we're not standing before some powerful 
potentate. We're standing before the Almighty God. When you stand before Him, nothing else matters. That's and you right. can stand up to anybody who comes after you, no matter what they may say. That's right. He was firm in his convictions. And here's something that just doesn't seem to fit with his story. He was filled with compassion. Our second lesson from Elijah involves kindness. We're prone to think of Elijah as a fiery, unflinching prophet. And he was, and he called down fire from heaven. And he was a fiery prophet. But the Bible also tells us that Elijah was a kind man. Let's pick up the story in 1 Kings 17. Here's what the Word of God says. And the Word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, Elijah, go to Zarephath, and that belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And I have commanded a widow to provide for you. So Elijah got up and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, here was this widow gathering sticks. And he called to her and he said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her again and he said, And please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. In other words, I'm at the last moment of life. I don't have anything left. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake first. And she's probably thinking, Are you kidding me? What is the matter with you? <laughs> and then he said, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day... Lord sends rain on the earth and she went away and did according to the word of Elijah and she and her household ate for many days and the bin of flour was not used up nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah that little story is one of God's most private picturesque miracles here was a prophet who cared for a widow and her son who were in distress as they shared their final grain and oil with this man of God, somehow the bin always had flour in it, and the jar of oil never ran dry. You see, Elijah was a kind man who could proclaim the law of God and still demonstrate the love of God. And that's a crucial balance for any of us who wants to overcome societal intimidation. What happens when somebody tries to intimidate us? We get mad and we try to intimidate them. Christians today are in a tough spot. On the one hand, we must never compromise our message. We must never dilute our values. We have a responsibility to speak truth to our generation and uphold the teaching of Scripture, especially on moral issues. Even That's the part there where you look at a good soldier that is just as fierce in battle as he is gracious in regular life that if you're a good soldier regardless whether you're a soldier for the american army or a soldier for god you have to be aggressive in times where you need to be aggressive towards calling down the holy spirit to protect you and it's just like what they was doing out here to me and to david and i my brother before he passed away in 20 and 17 they was trying to provoke us into a level that they was on. And I wasn't going to stand for it. Even when Mr. Donald Ridgeway, I had finally got enough of him to the point that I went out on the highway and I told him, I said, here I am, uh, take your best shot. He refused to swing at me and wanted to flip it and turn it around. Well, you swing first. I go, no, Donnie, you're the one that keeps riding around here towards wanting to get a rise. I go, you have risen me to the point that now I'm out here on the road with you. Now's your chance. As a coward, he wouldn't swing. 
but as a coward, turned around as I was walking away, calling me a coward. I wasn't the one that was picking the fight. I wasn't the one that was riding around the neighborhood seven or eight times a day that was screaming and hollering and laying down on the horn that was basically just infuriating and intimidating David and I Why David was trying to work the third shift. I wasn't the one who had cut, become unhinged over three or four big old dogs that come over here that wanted to tear up a bunch of my stuff pertaining to vandalism. I wasn't the one that cut down my own sign, that destroyed my own mailbox, that destroyed a sign on, on the cross out here that said peace and tore up two rocking chairs. What's more, this was of the devil's doings of people that wanted to vandalize our property. I wasn't the one that caused other people to stop and throw eggs and cuss us and challenge us the way that they did in the neighborhood. I had to restrain myself, and I had to keep a bay towards knowing just exactly what type of temptation or what type of intimidation towards being in, uh, falling into an entrapment that they were setting up for me. And once more, none of them took a swing. None of them come to my property and took me down. None of them grabbed a hold of my door handle and jerked me out of the car and attempted to beat the hell out of me. You know why? Because they was full of words. They was full of nothing but words. Because if they truly wanted a piece of me, I guarantee you somebody would have accommodated those type of pursuits that I, even to this day, look upon as being the last resort. Because the best thing about either a child of God or the child of a, of a demon is to try to use diplomacy before it gets to the point that you actually got to get down to a knockdown and drag out, regardless whether it's a hand-to-hand -hand combat or an actual war. I never would have thought that I would have had to have gone to war with my own people here in America just for standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I never would have thought that so many people would have, would have been against peace and utopia, just like Tommy Moore, the judge up in Dresden, Tennessee, that, that claims that he has faith in God, that claims that he has faith in the Bible, that claims that he has faith in the Holy Spirit, but yet now says that I have no faith in man, and because I have no faith in man, I don't believe that there'll ever be peace or utopia upon to the planet as long as mankind is living. His expression of peace and utopia will only come during the realm of heaven. Well, you know why? Because he has lack of faith. How many times did Jesus chastise his own people again and again and again? Oh, ye have little faith. Oh, ye have little faith. That was one of the main characteristics coming from Christ that was trying to disciple his disciples in telling them that they did not have proper faith. And even the Bible records it such as that if you have the grain of a mustard seed, the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to thy mountain, be thou removed, and it shall be removed. These people around here never had acknowledged First of all, that what I was preaching and teaching for the past 30 years was in fact factual. Okay? Second of all, rather than them enhancing or helping the ministry, they wanted to tear it down and destroy it. And Tommy Moore was part of that destruction. Because I told him just yesterday in a telephone call, I go, Tommy, you have never openly wanted to support the Windmill Ministries. And he mumbled something and, I don't know, kind of acted like we had a loose connection with our, with our telephones and suddenly I had a dropped call. So I had to call him back and whenever I called him back, it disrupted our conversation to the point that we immediately went over into some other issue. But the fact of the matter is the pillars of West Tennessee and Tennessee in general have never stood firm with the ministry that has always, always preached a message of love, grace, peace, and utopia. Once more, 
the ministry that God has ordained me to help orchestrate has not failed the people, but rather the people have failed the ministry. And I continue to say that again and again and again. And if I live to be 100 or 110, or if I die tomorrow, I'm going to continue to tell people the same story. This is, this is what actually occurred. This is what happened. Once more, my story lines up a great deal with the prophet Elijah. So please, let's listen to the rest of this. And when they have political ramifications... On the other hand, we don't want to alienate the people we're trying to win to Christ. That's right. We don't want them to think of us as ugly, harsh, and unloving. So we're trying to stand for what we believe the Bible teaches, and at the same time, we're trying to be compassionate and kind to these people. And I'm here to tell you, you can do both of those things at the same time. Go you can only if you're spirit-led and you're Holy Ghost-filled. You can do both. You can absolutely do both. But as far as using your own abilities or your own skills or your own uh, passion or your own whatever, no, you can't do it. Not if you're truly under a spiritual warfare, a spiritual attack, the way that my brother David and I was whenever I moved back to West Tennessee in 2014, that a lot I'm not, and I'm talking about hundreds of dozens of people around here are very familiar with my story as they was giggling and sniggering and thought that it was funny. They thought that, that all this was going on was some sort of an entertainment center. And it never was about entertainment. It was about us struggling to survive. Even my brother David made mention and said, Juby, Juby, if we wasn't living in the era that we're living in right now, they would have done already come out here and strung us up and hung us by a tree. And I looked at David. I said, you're absolutely right. And David also come clean on another statement that he made. He said, Juby, because of the things that we've been through pertaining to our father, our biological father that had post-traumatic stress syndrome coming out of World War II that was so mean and cruel with his discipline techniques, and because of the things that we was having to be uh, exposed to here in this area in Weekly County and Obion County, he looked at me and said, Juby, as far as I'm concerned, we line up with the Holocaust survivors because we're still living and we can still talk about it. I believe this was either in the year 20 and 15 or 20 and 16 because my brother David passed away shortly of in April, the Sunday after Easter, actually the day after Sunday Easter is when my brother passed away. God has called us to be people like that. Third lesson, he was fervent in prayer. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? In other words, she thought God sent Elijah to her house to punish her. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. And then he cried out to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. Prayer and intercession is God's way of using us to bring about the answers He desires on this earth. And some things that we deal with when the intimidating world is coming after us can only be accomplished through prayer. Fervent, righteous prayers. And then we have to be fearless before evil. After we have committed ourselves to the Lordship of Christ, after we have adopted an attitude of kindness, 
after we have begun praying with fervency we're ready to confront our culture with the boldness of the holy spirit and the next chapter in the life of elijah contains one of the most dramatic events in all of the bible after three years of drought and judgment the nation of israel teetered on the edge of a decision and elijah told ahab to gather atop mount carmel the 450 prophets of baal and the 400 prophets of asherah and i'll pick up the story in verse 21 because it's better than i could ever tell it and elijah came to all the people and he said how long will you falter between two opinions if the lord is god follow him but if baal follow him and the saddest thing in this scripture is the people answered him not a word i think that tonight there's probably some people here who need to hear that challenge you're teetering between two worlds you're trying to live for jesus christ over here but you want some stuff that you see in the world that you think is going to satisfy you but we know will not so you go back and forth from wanting to live for god to wanting to live for yourself and all the kicks that come from a worldly life and you hear the prophet elijah saying how long are you going to teeter between two worlds choose for yourself somebody if you're going to live for the world go live for the world but if you're going to live for god live for god with everything you have he called the people to that challenge and to that decision Verses 22 to 24, the events of the day are continued. Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. Now we know that wasn't true, but that's what he thought. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, he said, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, well spoken, well spoken. And so that's what they did. All day long the prophets of Baal pleaded with their God. I love to read this. They danced around and they leaped up and down on the altar. They cut themselves. They did everything, but Baal never showed up to consume their sacrifice. Now, this is why I like Elijah. Elijah feels like it's okay to have a little fun with these guys. So he's going to work on them. Right. So he makes fun of them. And I can't get into all the details, but, but he says some pretty interesting things to these guys. Right. And after he has made fun of them, when the false prophets had exhausted themselves... Elijah drenched his altar and his sacrifice with water in verses 36 through 39. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trenches. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Yes, he is. He is. But once more, Jeremiah was pushed into an atmosphere that he basically had to prove himself. He had to prove himself that God was in fact the true God that was with the prophet Elijah. You know, back 30-something years ago, I challenged the Neal family over in Kenton, Tennessee, and they refused to accept my challenge, and now I know why. Because their, their worship was obviously not sound to the point that they didn't want to be discovered by not so much of them being false, but in so much of me being true. True as far as my word, true as far as the things that I have taught, that I have went through, true as far as the anointing that's been placed upon in my life. And to this day, Terry Neal and Kay, his sister, 
and the rest of the family refuses to have anything to do with Dennis Jackson because they have already done burnt their bridges with him towards getting out here and telling people a falsehood, a lie about me. So, in essence, I know that I'm not going to be effective either in Kenton, Tennessee, or the direct area that I live in because of the seeds of Satan that has already done been planted towards wanting to destroy the teacher, the messenger, the prophet of God, um, the anointed one, the selected one, whatever terminology that you want to use. I know that people have solely desired that my message was a fake, false message to the point that I've been falsely accused of actually being the same thing that Jesus Christ was falsely accused. More so than just an infidel. But they falsely accused Christ of committing blasphemy which basically means that you're accusing him of being nothing but a out-and-out -out liar. You're accusing somebody of, of uh, heresy whenever you tell them that they are, in fact, a blasphemer. And Jesus was not a blasphemer that day. Not only was Jesus not a blasphemer that day, but Jesus was not a blasphemer throughout his whole life because he had the anointing of God upon his life. But I have went through similar type scenarios that I could relate to, not only with how they, how they accuse Christ inaccurately, but also how that the prophet of God pertaining to Moses going up against Pharaoh and the Egyptians, how that he had to bring hardship after hardship upon to the children of Israel before their eyes was ever opened out of pain and agony. Affliction after infliction after infliction fell upon to those people before they finally woke up and said, Moses' God is greater than, than ours. Just like Elijah. Elijah's God is greater than ours. You see, Jesus didn't come to prove his God other than his words being fulfilled that he would be raised on the third day. And he did get raised out of the tomb that now sits upon the right hand of the Father that makes intercession for all of us. Not just one of us, not just two or three of us, but for all of us. Because if it wasn't for the mercy of God, God would have done already come back and destroyed this planet. He would have destroyed this creation. But because of love and grace, gentleness, the other side of God, other than the side of wrath, God has chosen to be lenient upon to humanity to a certain degree, but God's patience only goes so far. Let's listen to the ending part of this message coming from 1 Kings 18, 36 through 39. It's God. Imagine the courage that God gave to Elijah in that moment. Here was a prophet who thought he was the only one left, the only one still committed to Jehovah, and before him were 850 false prophets, backed up by the most powerful couple and despicable couple on earth, Ahab and Jezebel. He was alone against all of them. A great multitude showed up to watch the drama, and Elijah stood like a flint, challenging the heretics, and he called down fire from heaven. Reminds me of the early church in the New Testament, when the early believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. It seems to me that more and more people are doing that today. As the times grow darker, God is raising up believers in unusual places and giving them the boldness to speak up for the gospel. Isn't it interesting how the same culture that preaches tolerance and openness and every viewpoint tries to silence the simple witness of the followers of Christ? But we have a right to be heard and we have a responsibility to hold up the cross of Christ to a needy world. 
we need to call fire down from heaven in a sense and preach revival to a world that is halting between two opinions and this is no time to be a secret disciple it's time to stand up for Jesus and to use every platform every opportunity that God gives us to preach his word with boldness Elijah was filled with conviction, firm in his compassion, fervent in prayer, fearless before evil. And one last thought that brings this back to the humanity of all of us, he was fueled by faith. The Bible says Elijah was different. He was kind. He prayed with fervor. He spoke with boldness. But then in the next chapter, the story takes a turn that we can hardly comprehend. You know it. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how that Elijah had killed all the prophets with the sword because remember after he called down fire all of his guys got together and they took out all the prophets of Jezebel they killed them all which did not make Jezebel happy and Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying so let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of those that you killed by tomorrow about this time and when he saw that, Elijah arose and he ran for his life. And I'm thinking, isn't this the guy who just stood up one against 850 and called down fire from heaven, and now he's running from, from a woman? <laughs> come, come on, Elijah. The Bible tells us that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, so we must have the capacity to do stuff like that too. In chapter 19, Elijah had something like a nervous breakdown. It says in verse 4, He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came, and he sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And he said, It's enough now, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Well, nobody ever told him he was better than his father's, but that's what happens to you when you get depressed. I've come to believe that many Christians are having problems today because of sheer exhaustion. We're running ourselves ragged, and at some point we need time for rest, sleep, nourishment, and replenishment. If you're having some kind of depressive episode in your life right now, perhaps exhaustion and fatigue are playing a role in it. God created us for rest, and if we're going to be great for God, we have to take care of our human bodies. There's not anything wrong with taking time to go and replenish our spirit. Elijah is a man like us, the scripture says, and he had this great victory on Mount Carmel, and God used him to... To, to stand up against the intimidation of his world. But in the process, Elijah got worn down. And God spoke to him and he said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Elijah had gotten his eyes on Jezebel instead of on Jehovah. He had become distracted by the Queen of Israel and forgotten about the King of Kings. <laughs> Anxiety takes over when we come to believe that our problems are greater than God's power. Sometimes that happens to all of us, but God knows how to reassure us with a still, small voice. I'm convinced that God primarily does this in our lives through His holy book, the Bible. The most precious thing in my life is how the Lord gives me specific verses to help me through specific times in my life. And God will do that. And God will also work on one's consciousness to the point that he or she knows without a shadow of a doubt what they're involved in or what they're doing or what they're saying is either wrong or right. That's one of the reasons why whenever Miss Jackson walked out of my life in 2005 and I realized what type of a snare that I had be befallen because of the poisonous of her wicked submission I have not touched, held, been around, hugged another female since that time. Now, to say that 
It's only because I've gained a lot of weight. This weight only be fallen upon to me since basically 2013. So from 2005 to 2013, I was an average person. I still had a strong sexual drive. I had to, uh, I had to readjust my whole life and having an, aff an affair with my wife and sometimes having sexual relationships with her two or three times a week, sometimes two or three times a day, to somebody's hot water that got turned off to a cold drip. And of course, whenever I come back here, the problems were so overwhelming to the point that I myself almost had a nervous breakdown, especially whenever I was falsely accused of so many different things. Once more, my life lines up with a lot of the persecution, and I'm sure your, yours does too as well, if you're a true Christian in Christ, pertaining to the persecution. I have come today to tell you that God is real, God is alive, Christ is alive, he sitteth upon the right hand of the Father, and soon, very soon, we will be delivered from this bondage and from this misery and sorrow, and from this horror that we as Christian society have had to experience just within the past few years. But of course, the Bible is very clear in reading the first four chapters in understanding that he has not found our works perfect yet. So it is still up to us to be good laborers to go out because the laborers are few but the harvest is, is plentiful, it's still up to us to go out and tell people about a living, risen Savior and to tell people that there's only one true way for a human being to enter into the kingdom of God, and that is through acceptance of the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want to thank you for listening. And like I said, I don't mean to piggyback upon somebody else's ministry, on somebody else's message today, but I felt like that it needed to be done in correspondence with Elijah or Moses or any of the prophets of God. They're not going to come back in a physical form. Even Jesus said, if they say that I'm in a desert place, do not go. If they say that I'm in a, in a cave or a tunnel, do not go. For as the lightning shineth, that shall be how Christ returns. He will return back sitting on the right hand of the Father, gathering up the elect from the four corners of the earth, spiritually speaking. He will not come back in a physical form. Neither will Moses or Elijah. And if somebody has taught you that, they have taught you a lie. Good luck to all of us, and shalom. And God bless and take care. And may the Lord be with us all in these last days. Thanks for listening to the Windmill Ministries in correspondence with this message at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255. God bless and God bless America.